like to welcome you to the award ceremony for the seventh annual Paul Engel Prize. My name is John Kenyon, and I'm the executive director of the Iowa City UNESCO City of Literature organization. So tonight's event is part of the Iowa City Book Festival, and this year we're celebrating two significant milestones. First, this is the 10th book festival. The event was started by the University of Iowa Libraries and the University of Iowa Press in 2009, in part because those involved thought that the newly christened City of Literature ought to have one. Over the years, the festival has grown from one day of programming on a blisteringly hot July Saturday at Gibson Square Park to the week-long programming that's occasionally a little bit on the chilly side that we have each October now. And as I mentioned, the City of Literature was brand new at that time. We've had the designation, or excuse me, we had had the designation for only about seven months at the time of the first book festival. And now this November, we will be celebrating our first decade as a UNESCO City of Literature. Early in the life of the City of Literature organization, we discussed things that we wanted to accomplish. We wanted to promote local writers. We wanted to encourage local readers. We wanted to connect and learn from other members of the UNESCO Creative Cities Network. But we also wanted to do more. We wanted to leverage our designation and the attention that comes with it to recognize writers who were doing exemplary things on and off the page. So in 2011, we established the Paul Engel Prize. Now Paul, for anyone who has attended these events over the years, surely knows, was the longtime director of the Iowa Writers' Workshop and the co-founder of the International Writing Program at the university. He also was a well-regarded poet, playwright, essayist, editor, and critic. But Paul also went above and beyond in his efforts to help writers, to promote our community, and to build empathy by connecting the far corners of the world through the written word. So in creating this prize, we wanted to recognize writers not just for their books, and their writing, but for the way that they affect their communities and the world at large through efforts beyond the page. As stated in the call for nominations each year, we seek to honor an individual who, like Paul Engel, represents a pioneering spirit in the world of literature through writing, editing, publishing, or teaching, and whose active participation in the larger issues of the day has contributed to the betterment of the world through the literary arts. The prize includes a $10,000 award, a one-of-a-kind work of art, and a trip to the Iowa City Book Festival. <laughs> Not necessarily in order of importance. The Paul Engel Prize is made possible through the generous support of the city of Coralville. This has been a wonderful partnership for us with the not insignificant perk that we get to have our annual ceremony in this beautiful space here in the Coralville Public Library. So thank you very much to the staff for helping to transform this space for our evening. And now I'd like to introduce Alice Names Galstead, who is the director of the Coralville Public Library and the president of the City of Literature Board, who will introduce our winner. Geography blended with time equals destiny, said the exiled Russian poet Joseph Brodsky, himself no stranger to relocation, having been booted out of the Soviet Union and found refuge in the United States, largely through the help of influential poet friends. I am always going home, always to my father's house, reads the first epigraph to Dina Nairi's novel, Refuge, quoting the German poet Novalis. Americans leave without saying goodbye. Refugees say goodbye without leaving, begins a novel by Laurie Colwin. I invite you now to think about yourself and your past, how geography has shaped you, how you have gone home again, how you have left without saying goodbye, and how you have said goodbye without leaving. Now imagine a little girl, just eight years old, when she and her mother and brother pack a few belongings and flee the country they are from, not knowing where they are going or where they will end up. That little girl is Dina Nairi, and it is also Nilu, the main character in her book Refuge. And it is also untold thousands of little children who flee their homes each year. 
By now, we are accustomed to horrifying footage from refugee camps, writes Nairi. We forget the psychological damage of purgatory, this waiting space in which you can never go back to your old life and identity, but haven't been told yet what your new one will be. Will your children have to learn German, Italian, or English? Will you work in your old profession again? Will 2030 find you lecturing in a university again, or driving an Uber, washing dishes, cleaning homes with a fraction of the books you once owned? Those of us who live in the United States have gotten a glimpse of what that purgatory looks like in recent months, though most of us have not experienced it ourselves. What happens to your destiny when part of your geography is a cage? How can you go home again to your father's house when you no longer know where your father is? Dina Nairi, a graduate of the Iowa Writers' Workshop, a graduate of Harvard and Princeton, and in her lifetime, a holder of passports from three countries, can tell us much about the refugee crisis around the world, from the United States to Europe and beyond. But as a writer, she can do something beyond that. She can make these refugees human. She can introduce us to a woman who feels, years after fleeing her homeland, that she must still be able to carry her life in a backpack. To a man who stayed due to homesickness and dope sickness, but now longs to flee. To a man who sets himself on fire because he can no longer tolerate purgatory. Nayuri reminds us that these are people noble and flawed, beautiful and broken, hilarious and heartbreaking, forever people who carry with them their pasts. Americans leave without saying goodbye. Refugees say goodbye without leaving. Here tonight to tell us something about what that means is Dina Nayuri, writer, Iranian, American, French woman, human, and winner of this year's Paul Engel Prize. Hello. Wow, thank you. This is such a great honor, and this is wow, beautiful. Um, I'm going to look at this for <laughs> a while. Um, I'm, I'm honored by your words, the just kind introduction, and your thoughtful take on my work. Thank you. And thank you so much for having me. Um, it's I, I don't know the word to describe what it feels like to be back here. I mean, this very formative place for me. But um, the last couple of days have been, um, you know, very moving and, and thoughtful for me because I've just walk, been walking around Iowa City and remembering this place that I came to when I went through sort of a second transformation, a second big transformation in my life. Um, the first one was, of course, becoming you know a refugee, becoming American, um, trying to I guess grapple with my identity um, as um, a citizen of a place. Um, who would I be? What language would I speak? But you know, after that, after I thought I or I had become settled, I suppose, in my Americanness, in my Westernness, um, I think I made a lot of choices that um, came out of all the fears of that time. And um, I went down the wrong career path and, and um, you know, made a lot of choices that I then wanted to backtrack from. So Iowa City was the place where I did that, where I, where I wanted to reset myself, to make myself into a writer, what I should have been from the beginning. Um, I had been, you know, I guess, in the business world doing something very safe. And um, one day I decided, you know, I'm going to try for this. And so I applied to the Iowa Writers' Workshop thinking, oh, they're not going to want me. Um, and, and then when um, I got the phone call and the invitation to come, I spent months and months thinking about how this would be a, um, a new beginning. You know, this would be a chance to be what I, the, the adult that I want to be, to create a voice for myself, to say something, um, to say it well. Gosh, how, to learn to say something well was such a um, monumental goal, and it felt very insurmountable, I guess, a, a, an obstacle, um, because I felt 
not so confident and weak. And um, anyway, so I packed my bags. I lived in Amsterdam at the time, you know, like my character. And um, I went to Iowa City. And for two years, um, I. I guess I thought about, again, can I be a writer? Who am I? Is this me? Um, is this transformation even possible? And I felt like an outsider. Um, I felt like an outsider to writing, uh, to the literary world, to, um, I guess, again, to America, because I had been in Europe for a while. Um, and Iowa City, I think, um, brought me back to life. Uh, the workshop brought me back to life. This community of writers and, and lovers of literature were just like, supportive and they wanted you to say the thing that you had to say and um, by the time I left I I had all that confidence I could be the person um, you know to speak about my experiences experiences of refugees and I could go out there and like find the stories I wanted to find and I felt like I had the skills and the tools to 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 do that and so to come back here it, it feels like revisiting a very crucial time and and it is such a monumental honor to be recognized by this city, which has meant so much to me. Um, another reason, now I'm getting a little bit emotional, um, another reason this means so much is because um, this award, you know, as you both said, is, is not just about writing. And writing for me is not just about writing. Um, writing has always been about saying something um, that will change people's minds and will make them, you know, do something. Um, that will affect the lives of the people that um, I guess I've encountered along the way. Um, so I guess to receive an award that is for doing something meaningful for the world um, is, is meaningful to me. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about some of what I've seen in the last you know, 12 months researching my next book um, because I think in the last year and a half, I started to get the feeling that I need to do much more, you know, to address the refugee crisis. And, um, you know, I started to notice that the world's perception of us had changed and that the kind of people that I had encountered when we first arrived, these kind, welcoming Americans who knew nothing about our life but still wanted to know about it and wanted to welcome us, um, they were becoming quieter, I guess. Um, uh, for, uh, you know, it, 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 they were rarer, I suppose, in my life. And I started to hear um, all of this loud resistance to people arriving and, you know, taking a place in, in these countries. And I was living in Amsterdam and I kept hearing the voice of Geert Wilders, this horrible man, who, politician, who just, his whole platform is keeping refugees out. And he warns people of the Netherlands about, you know, uh, Netherlands becoming Nether Arabia. Um, and uh, you know he incites all of this hatred and all of this like passion against foreigners that is all completely without basis. And so I thought, okay, well I can't just go out there and um, um, you know just spew rhetoric back. I need to go and find stories. I need to show people what these individual experiences uh, individual experiences are. So um, last year I started traveling to refugee camps and to um, refugee communities and communities of people who had been rejected um, from asylum in various countries in Europe. So in England where I live, in the Netherlands where I used to live, in Germany and so on. And um, a, a lot of the communities that I visited um, are Iranians because that's a language that I speak um, and it's um, a culture that I can relate to so it's easy to sit down and just get people to tell me what their experience has been like. And, um, you know, yeah, it, it was, I, I, again, I don't know the word to describe this. Humbling is the wrong word. Moving is the wrong word. It was some strange combination of it that felt like just sat heavily on my chest because um, the experiences of people now is so much heavier and more um, um, traumatic and more damaging and more heartbreaking than what I experienced. Um, and, you know, little children are being subjected to it. Uh, you know, at, at an early age is such more dramatic um, I guess, 
you know, experience of crossing over into a new life. Um, when I went to the refugee camp, I went to a couple of them in Greece. Um, one of the things that the staff there were trying to do was to find ways to give people food and clothing with more dignity because it had gotten to the point that these camps were so busy that people were basically just throwing the food and the clothing out of trucks at them. And these are people who used to be doctors and lawyers and, and um, you know, craftsmen, and, and now they had to give up their dignity just to get food and just to get clothing. And so there were, you know, charities who would go through and set up stores, you know, or set up, you know, various, you know, more dignified ways of helping, you know, uh, distributing food, et cetera. And so um, through these charities, I, I got to sit down and talk to some of these people. And, and the primary thing that they would talk about is this loss of the sense of who they were, of their dignity, of their pride. Um, how would their children see them? How would, um, you know, they fit into a community and still be the person that they used to be, you know, even if they are the one driving the Uber. Um, and so I think it, it just it just made me rethink about how I think of this crisis because it's not just about you know whether or not we open the doors, you know, to our country or you know to other countries in Europe. Um, it's about so much more. It's about how we um, approach each other and how we talk to each other and how we um, look at each other as humans. I mean, if somebody was coming to your door. Um, wanting, I guess, rescue, you wouldn't just think about whether you'll open the door or not. You'd also think about how you will treat them and how they will impact your life and how you know, you'll interact with them as a human. And so I guess my work with this is, is about trying to show that, you know, uh, to take these stories and everything that I've seen in the camps and everything that I saw um, in these refugee communities, especially in the communities of people who've already been rejected, um, and to try to, you know, um, I guess make people see that you know it's not so much um, a faceless crisis. It's a crisis made up of individual people, and so many of them children. Um, I'm going to tell you a little story about um, when I was on my way out of this camp that I visited in Greece last year. Um, you know, it was full of Iranians and Afghan refugees. And um, when I came in, they were so welcoming. And you know, they each had these little metal connexes, or ISO boxes, they call them, which are shipping crates that had been converted to a residential space. And um, each of them had their own. And this was a vast improvement over the hell of Moria, which is um, a, a hellish camp on Lesbos Island in, in Greece, where people first arrive when they're in those inflatable boats. And there, you know, there's. Um, you know, sewage everywhere, and three-hour lines to get the most basic food, and uh, fights in the middle of the night, and it just it's, it's a horror. So this camp that I went to, though, is where they would bring people after they've moved through that. You know, they've been processed in the island. Maybe they've spent two or three months there. And then they um, were brought to Katsikas, which is this field of shipping crates. And they're each, each family is given a shipping crate. And they, um, you know, they live there waiting. They just wait. You know, sometimes they will wait a year. Sometimes they'll wait, you know, who knows, a month. Um, but during this time, I went from um, ISO box to ISO box, knocking on doors and asking, you know, will you tell me your story? Um, can we have a cup of tea? Can, can we talk? And they would always say yes. Um, but near the end of one of my um, visits, after we had, you know, I had talked to this family with, you know, there was a son and a daughter and mother and father, um, you know, for a long time, for a couple of hours, they told me this long story of their escape from the Taliban. And afterwards, there was a moment of silence, and this, um, the mother looked at me and said, will you take my son? And I just, I did not know what to say. This boy was nine, you know, and he was sitting there, and he was hearing this. And his sister, who was eight, was right there, and she was hearing too. And I said, what? What do you want me to do? And, and she said, very seriously, will you, will you take my son um, to England? And I said, how can I do that? You know, I, I'm not his mother. I don't have his papers. I can't take him. And she said, I, you know, I, I bet there's a way. You know, and she, she had completely given herself up to a world of fantasy in which it was possible for me to sneak him into, into England. But then when she saw that that was not possible, she said, can you drop him off at a camp? He, he knows what to do. And I thought so hard that night about the conversations that they must have had, because this boy was sitting there. It wasn't the first time he had heard this. 
um, you know, about the options open to them and I guess the calculus of all this, like what will we do if we're here for a year, for two years? We will find some way for this boy to be snuck into one of these countries and he'll grow into an adult and then he'll bring us over. Um, that conversation changed the way that I see all of it um, because this is not the refugee experience that I went through. This is not how it was 30 years ago. Um, this is the way it is now. And it's, it's, you know, so much worse, you know? It, things have gotten so much worse than they were. And that's just not how history should move. Um, so I'll s stop speaking about that. Th that book will be out next year and you can read more of these stories, but um, I guess we were going to have a little talk. Yes. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for those remarks. Very moving. And so I am going to ask Dina a few questions, and then we will leave some time for questions from the audience. I'll get my clock out here so we can <laughs> okay. keep track of that time. Um, so one thing, if you don't mind me handling your prize. Oh, yes. Be careful with it. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to kind of start with this because and explain this. Every year we work with designers from MC Ginsburg, mm -hmm. and you probably remember them from downtown Iowa City. And we create a one of a kind work of art to give rather than just a, a statuette. We create a piece of work that reflects the author and the author's work. And this has been a tradition from the very beginning. So we've given seven of these prizes now, and we've given seven different prizes from MC Ginsburg. And this year's prize was inspired, we were talking with the designers and our staff, we were looking at your work and trying to figure out what inspiration should be drawn from this. And so this was actually uh, inspired by a line from the essay that you wrote for The Guardian last year, The Ungrateful Refugee, which now you have the new book coming out next year on that. And you wrote, it is the obligation of every person born in a safer room to open the door when someone in danger knocks. Well, now I'm going to cry. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll give you a moment to compose yourself. Thank you. No, I'm not going <laughs> to compose myself now. <laughs> but so this was the uh, interpretation. Again, some folks on our staff uh, shared some ideas, and, and the designer kind of came up with a, a way to depict that here. And I mean, that's a very powerful statement that you made in that piece. And I was thinking about that, and it's one thing for us to think about that collectively, mm -hmm. that we as a country, we as a society, should open the door when someone who is in danger knocks. But you have taken steps now to kind of open that door individually, which is a much more difficult process. It's a much more uh, dedication, much more dedication behind that. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you see that, that individual responsibility to do that versus you know, me standing up and saying, yes, the United States should take in more refugees, which is, yeah. that doesn't take me anything to do. Well, I mean, I think um, it's a couple of things. First of all, I, you know, it all, everything that we do on all politics comes down to individual stories anyway. And I think one of the problems with the refugee crisis is that people don't see this, you know? Like, or they don't realize this, even though, you know, they have the instincts for it. So, you know, they think, okay, well, you know, they, first of all, they've been fed a lot of false language, so like hordes and swarms and all of these things that get, put mental images um, in your head about a plague, you know? Um, and uh, so they think about these faceless hordes and they think about all the people coming in and um, they don't think that, you know, actually every single um, experience that they're going to have with refugees is going to come down to an individual interaction. And, and, and most people find something human to love in each other when they meet someone. This is just how we are as humans. We look for connection. Um, so most of the experiences that people have are actually very, very positive. But then you'll talk to your average, you know, staunch anti-immigration person. And, uh, you know, they'll say, well, I have a neighbor, you know, from Afghanistan or Syria, and he's great, but you know, all the rest of them. And then you're like, that, that's what it is. It's just one person and another and another, and that's what it adds, that's, they are adding up to the crisis that you think is, is so scary. Um, 
So I think for me to bring things back to the individual is vital. Um, you know, and I think as writers, that's what we do all the time anyway, especially fiction writers. You know, they tell one story, one person's story, and they try to make that moving, make it come alive. Um, but that person's life is supposed to be a stand-in for something um, and to mean something. And it's supposed to make you know, the reader change their heart or mind a little bit you know, about something. Uh, so I think for me, I want to just do that more directly. I want to take the stories that I've found and to you know, show it to hopefully an audience that maybe wouldn't normally pick up my novels. Um, I would really love it if some, you know, um, anti-immigration people would pick up this and just give, read it and give it an open mind. I think um, one of the things that surprised me when I was writing this book was how many stories I had of the native born and refugees like, loving each other, just doing good in each other's life and uh, surprising each other with their capacity to love. So I, that's one of, that can only be shown on an individual level. There's no other way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you kind of lead well into my next question. You have dealt with your own life experience and, and that of others mm -hmm. through fiction, for the most part, through uh, your first novel dealing with I guess what it would be like if someone was left behind when others were moving out uh, into the refugee experience. Refuge, your last novel, deals very much with your own experience in fictionalized form about what it's like for someone to actually go off and, and go through that experience firsthand. Mm -hmm. But you've been dealing with it in fiction. And now, as you were alluding to in your remarks, you've kind of made a turn. Yeah. And you're dealing with it in nonfiction. I was wondering, I mean, do the times seem to call for that? Do you think that we need that personal connection that's not enough to have a fictionalized person that we're trying to empathize with, we need real stories? Well, it's not that it's not enough. It's the, I, I personally have things I want to say directly, you know? And there are rules in fiction, and they're, they're there for a reason, and they're beautiful. You know, you're supposed to show things and let, you know, a person's life unfold um, in a way that, you know, feels, is rooted in the five senses, and it feels, you know, um, kind of, I guess, visceral to the reader. And then the reader can um, make their own, you know, um, they can kind of take their own lessons from it, I suppose. Um, and, and they can make of it what they will. And it's not really the fiction writer's concern to what those will be. Um, of course, you know, the fiction writer always has something in their mind. But you know, it's not direct. I feel the need right now in my life to say something more directly, because I feel like there's lots of refugee and immigrant fiction out there. And there are people who are just not seeing the thing that we want them to see. And, and with this essay, I, I just wanted to say, like, flat out, like, have you forgotten that this is people's lives? You know? I, um, I actually, I was talking yesterday to this class of young would-be writers um, um, about um, why I almost didn't publish this essay. And the, I actually had some version of it on my laptop for like two years, and I yeah. didn't put it out there. And the reason was this, I thought it was too simplistic. You know, I, th I thought the refugee crisis is so big and so complicated, and there's so many economic factors and political factors and you know, like um, psychological factors, and you know, I'm not really addressing all of those things. Um, I'm saying something too simple, which is, oh, well, but they're going to die, though. You know? And that's too simple. Um, the reason I put it out there is because Brexit had just happened and the election here had just happened and I had a little girl who was you know, very new. She was born in December 2015. And um, I was just so afraid of the world she was going to live in and I thought, okay, wait, I wanna be simple about this. What about the fact that they're going to die? You know, um, Why are we talking about the fact that this street will change or that there'll be too many mosques in Amsterdam? Why, why do we care about how many mosques there are in Amsterdam? Um, so it, it, I felt the need to say something directly and simply, and I think you just have to do that in essay form and, and nonfiction form. And, and with the book that um, I'm, I've just finished writing, you know, every chapter is a stage of um, the refugee experience. So it starts with escape, and then there's camp, and then there's asylum and assimilation. And then at the end, there's a chapter on cultural repatriation, this desire to go back. So it covers the arc of a refugee's life. And in each chapter, it's not just the stories that I've found. I also, and, and my own story, I, I, I kind of try to grapple with the idea of what that is. Like, so the chapter on camp, 
I, I, I reflect on waiting. You know, what is waiting? Waiting is abjection. Waiting is being, um, I guess, subject to somebody um, else's, you know, decisions. It's a loss of power. The person who makes someone else wait has all of the power. Um, so I, I wanted to say these things directly to the readers, and so this was the form to do it in. Mm -hmm. And so particularly with this essay, from what <laughs> I understand, I mean, you've received an awful lot of feedback, I'm sure negative feedback, but yeah. some positive feedback, and, and from folks who are in the situations that you're writing about. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what you've heard from folks, I mean, that you are giving voice to things that they have had trouble breaking through with. Yeah, I, um, well, that, I think the, the most moving part of all this has been when refugees or former refugees, um, and, well, actually, especially new ones um, or, or ones in the process of assimilation have written or um, have said, you know, through friends or in some other way that, you know, this was something they didn't feel okay saying. Because the whole, you know, this essay was about gratitude. It was right. about, you know, the, the fact that refugees are expected to posture gratitude, you know, to the native born and to live their lives just atoning, you know, for, for having had this one moment of need. So, um, of course, when you feel that way, when you've internalized that, you can't actually come out and say it until 20 years have passed. Well, for me, 20 years have passed. So um, the, uh, the, the most moving comments were when people said, OK, I, I couldn't say this. And so I'm glad that you did. But maybe they'll listen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Now, you, you talked a little bit in your remarks about your own experience that you went through and saying it's very different today. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that experience for you as a young girl and, and coming to Oklahoma mm -hmm. and dealing with those issues of, at the time, wanting to assimilate and feeling like people weren't letting you or, or it felt like there was a real push-pull. They wanted you to, but they weren't maybe giving you the chance to do that. Yeah, actually, that's a really interesting paradox there because they, that's exactly it. You know, I think they were very um, forceful and eager to, like, make us American. You know, so to be American um, was the way that they would be comfortable. And it soon became the way, the only way we could be comfortable. I was very desperate to become American quicker and to shed all signs of my Iranianness. And if it, a part of my Iranianness came out, I felt a, a deep shame, you know? And, um, but I think that that, um, forcing of a natural process to happen quicker just actually you know held it back you know mm -hmm. like stifled the whole thing I, I, I um, um, there's um, there's a portion of St. Augustine's prayers. Have you have you read the? So, so <laughs> where they're not um, memorized. Yeah, he talks about. Uh, yeah, no, and I don't have the, the thing that I'm going to tell you about. I don't have memorized either. But he talks about how he like wishes God to change him, but not yet. You know, <laughs> and 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 I think that what he's acknowledging there is the notion that real change happens slowly. You know, and you know it takes a lot of wisdom and self-awareness to say, okay, you know, God, like, don't change me tomorrow because that wouldn't be real and I wouldn't be able to, you know, deal with it. Um, but do change me over time into this better person that I want to be. Now, in the case of assimilation, I think there's a great parallel there because refugees and immigrants and um, you know all of us outsiders, I suppose, we do want to change somewhat because we want to make a community with the people that we live with. Um, we want to be part of building something, part of changing a place as time changes a place, um, and then change with it in the natural way you know, of things. Mm -hmm. um, but if we're forced to posture that change every day, um, well, it just it doesn't leave enough room for the actual transformation. Um, so I, I guess for me, um, you asked specifically what it was like for me. I did a ton of posturing. I mean, and I was a kid and I was a teenager, and so you know there was some of that, you know, that. Um, but I remember once my father came to visit, you know, from Iran, and he actually was successful in coming to visit us twice um, when I was um, living in the U.S. So both times we were in Oklahoma, and then after that, um, he could never get another visa to come and see us, but. When I was 14, 14 or 15, he came and he visited us. And he said, um, after a couple of days together, where every moment I was like, don't speak Farsi. No, don't do that. Don't wear this. Can you just not talk? Or can you just shave off that mustache for while you're here? <laughs> <laughs> and then um, 
you know, he said to me once, you know, why don't I next time, just like, instead of just coming directly here, why don't I stop in Texas and just like go through some kind of like Iran washing car wash <laughs> where, where they like take off all of the Iran and then I can come like a blank slate and you can make me into this ideal American father. And you know, he thought he was being so funny and, but I remember thinking like, yeah, that would be awesome. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so I, I kind of feel like that feeling of that wanting was always there. Mm -hmm. So there's been a lot of conversation out there politically over the last 18 months, two years mm -hmm. about immigration and refugees and all of that. And, and there's been a lot of criticism from folks who say that they think people, if they come here, they should speak the language, mm -hmm. they should act the way we want them to act. We don't want them to bring their lives and their culture with them. But you, as you were writing about this new book that you have coming out, you said, I think of how necessary it is to show refugees as they are, the full arc of their story. I want to show how they become enmeshed in a community, how they live, what they suffer, how they love and are loved by the native born. And you talked about how in the West, the label refugee can become a permanent siphon of identity and power. Mm -hmm. So it feels like you're really pushing back against that. I mean, and, and what you had to go through, what you felt like you had to do to kind of shed your Iranianness, as you said, mm -hmm. and to allow people to bring their culture in and to not feel like they have to fully assimilate. Yeah. But I think like being yourself is such a privilege. Like the 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 entitlement, I guess, or the allowing yourself to just kind of be whatever you are, all the good and the bad. I mean, it's it it is a great privilege and I think it's one that comes slowly, you know, when we're well adjusted and when we're in our own home and when we're in our own community, we naturally build that and we don't see it. You know, we we're blind to the things that we have. Um, and I think this is one of the things that refugees feel most viscerally when they arrive somewhere is this notion that, okay, well, they have to be aware of everything they do. Um, I, I've, I've, so many of the refugees I talked to like expressed um, habits and things that show that they don't trust their own five senses, you know, um, anymore. Like there's, there's one um, young man who would just adhere to sell by dates so religiously. And I, uh, you know, and the, the person that he was staying with who was hosting him would say, you know, well, you know, you can just smell that. Just trust your nose. And he would say, well, no, but I, no. And there's something deeply psychological that prevented him from trusting his nose. I mean, for one thing, the food was foreign, but, but then there was just the fact that you, you just, do almost go through that Texas car wash and um, you know, you're just raw and you don't trust anything, you need someone to tell you. Um, and you don't need that when you're in your own home. You are able to just be the good and bad of yourself. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of, um, I think it was, um, f there's an essay by Philip Roth, was it? it was writing about Jews, is that Philip Roth? Anyway. Yeah, sure. <laughs> like, I'm like looking right at my friend Liz there. <laughs> anyway, um, but this, this essay was kind of a response to the Jewish community who said that he had um, show in his fiction, he showed Jewish people in ways that were kind of unflattering. And this made, you know, people more anti-Semitic and it kind of fed into everything that people already believed about Jews. And what he wrote in this essay was, it's a privilege to show a person as a full realized human being. Like, that's how we take you know, power. That is how we show that we're the same, by showing our good and our bad, and not hiding our bad as if it's their point of view that matters, and only their point of view. Um, if you only show the best of yourself, that means you really care you know, what the other person thinks, whereas the most settled among us we're just us, right? So that was a really roundabout way of answering the question. Which <laughs> <laughs> like, um, but yeah, that's what I meant by like all of those parts of them that I want to show. And that's what I meant by like a siphon of identity because mm -hmm. that, that, there's half of your identity you can no longer show. You can't show you're ugly, you know? Um, I think it's like, I think if I had to go through life where like say the 10 closest people around me, neighbors, teachers, employers, whatever, um, couldn't see any of my worst parts. I would, all of my creativity would drain away. All of um, my sense of self and my confidence to live. You'd spend all your time and energy just thinking about what not, not to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So one thing I wanted to get at, uh, again, I'm hitting on this essay, it was so powerful. I don't mm -hmm. want to keep harping on it, but uh, for folks who have not read it, it's in the, uh, the grad, or not the graduate, the, uh, <laughs> the Guardian, excuse me. You're staying at the graduate, yes. it's in the Guardian. Um, 
uh, and uh, it's called The uh, Ungrateful Refugee. But in there, you were talking about uh, the fact, again, that refugees are made to feel like they should be grateful for being able to come here and mm -hmm. such. Now, at the same time, I was struck by, uh, in the author's note to your book, Refuge, you wrote, the enormity of my good luck still frightens me. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, people would say, well, isn't that gratitude? Yeah. But you know, as you think of luck, you know, luck is what opportunity plus hard work in some ways, and I think people look at the opportunity that it's pro provided, and they ignore the hard work yeah. that helps to get people there. And it feels like that's what you're trying to show well, that it's not you just you come here and you're given everything, but it's it's tremendously difficult. But you are given a lot, and I think sure. I think I think what I was trying to say, um, and actually one thing that I have had to say a lot after this essay was, you know, I am grateful. Mm -hmm. I am so grateful. I walk around every day, like felled by my own gratitude, um, and and in awe of little things. Like I find myself, I'm 39 years old now. And and um, I lived those refugee years from eight to 10. And so it's been a long time. And there are times where I actually like marvel for a second when the water turns on and it comes out hot. I mar mar marvel for a second when my card goes through, you know, and there hasn't been some kind of like dumb things that should have become okay and every day by now. And I think like those moments of marveling are, are the gratitude. And But the thing is that gratitude is private. It's between you and the people that you love and your, you know, it, it's the thing that creates your sense of civic duty and your sense of like, you know, what you're going to do for your country, for your community, et cetera. It is not to be postured to another person. Do you know what I mean? Like the gratitude that I was talking about in that essay, it, it wasn't actually gratitude, it was, you know, the expectation of it that I was trying to say, you know, I, um, um, I think we should do something about that because when, for example, you know, in the essay I talk about when a teacher will look at me and instead of answering like a question that I have, will say, "Oh, honey, you must be so grateful, you know, to be here." Um, that's this expectation that she should not have to go the extra mile for me as a refugee kid because I should be so grateful to be here. That's a very individual thing, you know. Now, to be grateful to a country that has saved your life, I mean, I can't imagine anybody. Um, who wouldn't feel that way? I mean, mm -hmm. of course I feel grateful. Sure, sure. So one thing that you have done through your work is to get the stories of, of other people out, but you also, through teaching, are mm -hmm. working to help people tell their own stories. Yeah. And you had mentioned this earlier, but you did a workshop yesterday with the Iowa Youth Writing Project, mm -hmm. which is something that we usually try to partner with when we bring Engel Prize winners to town. Um, what did you take away from working with those young women on trying to tell their own stories and, and showing them how you've told your own. Yeah. Well, first of all, they were amazing, you know, so engaged and yes, so young, you know, and so confident um, in telling their stories. And I think um, I love working with teenagers because first of all, you know, they have opinions, they've seen the world, they, there's things that they want to say. Um, but at the same time, their perspective is always so unique and surprising because it hasn't been shaped for years and years and years by what everybody else is saying. But I think that um, well, what we talked about yesterday was, um, you know, I was trying to, to show them how you can like, um, I guess, start with a scene, a surprising scene, a, a moment that was, is kind of, um, I guess, visceral for one person. You know, um, and after scene after scene after scene, kind of get your reader um, to just come to right before, like, believing the thing you want them to believe, and then you say it, you know? Whereas that thing that you say might have been outrageous to them if they hadn't read all of the pieces of the story. So I asked them to write their own little scene, you know, whether it be from their life or fiction, um, that is going to eventually argue for some things. So um, the thing that surprised me is how like thoughtful they had been about some of the biggest issues of the day. So like at first they had to choose an issue that might be controversial that they cared about. So for example, um, um, somebody chose like voting, you know, and somebody else chose animal rights, and um, it, you know they were very good at reaching in and finding just something moving and rooted in the five senses and just showing us that moment vulnerably and openly and, and, and uh, you know, uh, to, to the point where just with that one scene you could say, okay, you know, I can see why you feel this way about animals and, you know, I can see why, you know, I would feel shame not to vote after having, you know, 
read that scene. Anyway, so they just impressed me with their passion for issues and with their ability to kind of reach in and be vulnerable with a moment from their life. Great. So now I think we'd like to open it to the floor and see if anyone here has any questions. Uh, because we are taping this, I will ask that you shout out your question, and then I will try to summarize so that we make sure we've got it uh, hearable, audible on that. So if uh, anybody has any questions, go ahead and raise a hand. Yeah. Um, so briefly, you mentioned moving kind of from the safer world of business and following your true passion to pursue being a writer and feeling this need to not only share your own story, but the stories of others. Um, can you speak kind of like on the importance of telling stories in kind of today's world versus this kind of safe world of, of business? Um. Well, I mean, I, I think, um, well, stories, I, I mean, I think a lot of people, a lot of writers would agree, most writers would agree, are the most, the greatest persuasive tool that we have, you know? And um, I think people make them so complicated and difficult, and it's really so simple to tell a moving story. You just have to, you know, be truthful. Be truthful with the details, you know? And I think it's funny that that's so simple and yet it takes so many years to, to master it and it's such a joy to try to master it. Um, but I think that's, you know, the thing about them that makes them important, you know? Um, they're really the only thing that can change people's mind. You know, you will never change people's mind by like shouting some point of view at them. But you can change someone's mind by telling them a story. Now, in the business world, um, I think people throw a lot of empty rhetoric at each other. Um, but one thing I noticed that felt um, really, I guess, unsatisfying to me and also just really false was how they, whereas in the, in the writing world, um, we try to just get at the simple five senses and to try to make you see a moment and hear a moment and smell and taste it and to live in it with that character so that maybe at some point you can be like, you know what, maybe the world should be this way, right? In the business world, um, they try to make use words to not make things clearer like that, but to make it more obscure and muddy and like hard to pin down, you know? So instead of using those concrete words and those beautiful, precise images, they use ones that are just kind of floating somewhere near the point, you know? Um, and, and the point of that is to try to like escape culpability and to protect yourself. It's not to communicate. It's not to move people. It's not to try to like, um, uh, I guess, it's not to try to make them think better or deeper about something. It's to make them see you as an asset and to not find any mistakes in the things that you've said and to not be able to hold you accountable. A lot of communication, and this is, this is a very broad thing to say, and a lot of communication in the business world has that goal, but of course a lot of it doesn't. But my experience of the business world and business school was that. And it left me very unsatisfied, and it left me with a lot of um, feelings of guilt and the la like also feelings that I am not using my talents you know, in the right way to help the world. You know? And I can see myself after 30 years feeling very empty and very sad if I've spent all that time lying with words, you know? <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Have you been back to Iran since? Yes. You're Iranian. Yes. <laughs> that it's such an unmistakable accent. It like hits me right in the gut. Um, no, no, I can't, well, for several reasons. When we left, um, we, you know, escaped under kind of very shady, shady circumstances, and my mother um, was in a lot of danger. She was in a lot of trouble, so um, it was impossible to go back for the first several years, and then for like two decades after, it was just too scary to even contemplate. Um, but then I got an opportunity, actually, a couple of years ago, there was a magazine who wanted to do a feature, and they asked me, "If will you go? We'll send you. We'll send protection." Um, if you, you know, go and you can kind of travel from city to city and write about 
you know, the culture. And this was such an interesting opportunity to me. It was a chance to go back to see my family, to like, you know, write about it. Um, and so we got pretty far in the process, but then they got a fixer, like someone who's supposed to protect you. And he did a lot of Googling and he said, considering the things that she's written, we, I can't guarantee her safety. So the editor said, well, maybe you shouldn't go. And so I didn't, that was the one time I thought about it. I came here 45 years ago. Yes. In the past 30 years, I have been going every year. Yeah, and you were fine. It's the beautiful feelings when you walk, you leave the plane, you just walk, put your step in the airport and to the street. Each time is different. Yeah. And home, I guess it's changed a lot. But if you go back every single year, I guess it changes slowly for you. To me, when I look at my friends, I get scared. <laughs> because I can see the changes in them. I'm sure you see the changes in me. Yeah. <laughs> I have changed. The country has changed. But the still, to me, is a still home. Yeah, it is. And when I go there, then I miss here because of the family and wives and kids and grandkids. So I refer to myself as a man with no country yeah. because, you know, either way, I just missed out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think there's so many ways to look at that, too, because you're right. There's this feeling of lack of country, of, like, statelessness. Um, you always are missing some place. But it's also nice to think that, you know, um, I have these two places to which I belong, you know? Like, I, I belong to that life fully and completely. And, like, you know, I can do a, a Nowruz and a good Gorma Sabzi. Or, and then I could come back here and just, you know, try to be, I guess, American somehow. Um, yeah. I think it changes moment to moment. All right. We've got time for a couple more. Yeah, we'll in the back. Uh, you sense in the trends? Hey, did you hear that? So any trends or changing trends in... Uh, popular political attitudes toward refugees? Are they getting softer? Or are they getting worse? So trends in popular political attitudes toward refugees? Yeah. In, in Europe, did you say? Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I mean, I, I don't have uh, like an aggregate you know, set of data on this. But from my experience and what I've seen, it feels as though like there's a, a division, just like there is here, you know, between cities, and countryside between um, you know people who come into contact with refugees all of the time, um, they tend to be more kind of open and liberal because because all of their when, when you say refugees they immediately get faces and names in in their head and they think okay yeah no I like these people they're my friends they're my neighbors you know they're people who've done good work for me you know. Whereas I think when you get into more rural places, the unknown it becomes very, very scary. A lot of them haven't actually ever met any refugees, but they think that if they come in, they'll take all of their jobs. And so they tend to have a very harsh attitude toward immigration. And I think you know, they're the ones who drove Brexit. You know, the Brexit vote in England was largely about immigration. It was about you know, kind of, I guess, closing the doors to the rest of the EU. So, um, uh, so yeah, I think I don't know how they're changing. I know that certainly they continue to get more complex and thoughtful in places where people interact with each other, you know, and they, and and the rest of it, unfortunately, it's just fear feeds on fear, and there's plenty of people who would, who love to take advantage of that. Politicians who will just say more and more, you know, about all the bad that refugees might do. Very much like here. Any final questions? Oh, we've got plenty. Yeah. Just curious about you have a son like that, you have a child? Yes, I have a daughter. And I'm just curious about uh, raising your child in America and uh, how your child will reflect your Iranianness or. Well, this is tough. Well, we're raising her in England, so I live in. Uh, yes, yes. So there's that strangeness because she's getting this English accent. <laughs> and and for me, it's just like another absurdity to add to all the absurdities of my life. You know, I, I've had so many strange accents in my life. You know, as I was learning English, and and so finally, I kind of settled on okay, American. I'm American. I'm good with this. And then I fell in love with a British man, and we moved to England. And suddenly, we have this British kid, who. <laughs> it's funny because even her personality is is kind of 
like British. <laughs> and I, you know, it makes me think about things like what makes us, you know, we're made by our surroundings. I mean, she is not a product of like just of my genes, you know, she's a product of everyone around her and her community. And I love that. I absolutely love that. Unfortunately, the Iranianness has kind of fallen to the wayside because, you know, we all communicate in English. Um, Farsi is a difficult language. You have to be, you know, immersed in it. But we're going to start that with her soon because it matters to me to preserve my culture. Um, and and, there's, and her father, his language is French, you know, his mother tongue. So we have to fit that in. <laughs> I'm sure it'll be good. I don't, I don't know. I don't know how we're going to manage it, but at some point it'll all fall into place. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> OK, there were a couple other hands out here. Yeah. I read your Guardian article last night. Oh, did you? Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> and the, the, the point of the obligation to greet the stranger. So there's a scenario, I think, of often for IOC mm -hmm. uh, in the future. And I'd like you to tell me your thoughts about this scenario for Iowa City uh -huh. uh, in terms of the point you were making in the article. Yeah. So in the same way that in 2015, 2 million refugees entered Europe in one summer, and many communities were flooded with 4,000 immigrants, refugees on yeah. one weekend. Yeah. So with climate change happening as it is, by 2075 or 2100, there, will, there could very well be mass flows coming from Arizona, Texas, Mexico, El Salvador mm -hmm. to the Midwest here. And it's very likely that on one weekend, Iowa City will be flooded with four to five to 6,000 immigrants, refugees, in City Park. Mm -hmm. And they are, will be permanent. This is a, is a future for the planet. Yeah. So how would you respond in light of your article to this new situation where it really requires an incredible transformation and inner sacrifice by the whole city yeah. to a whole new feature of human living from mass, mass refugees? Well, I mean, um, it's the same with the refugees from like Syria. I, mean, I, 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 I don't really see, right? I don't see a, a difference, I guess, in, in the type of refugees, just if they are kind of coming in in, in large numbers. Um, but you, you're right that it takes a lot of um, a lot of sacrifice and a lot of graciousness and a lot of like. Um, I guess a lot of hard emotional work on the part of the native born because the thing is that when we're born with something um, we it, it becomes just part of the air all around we don't think of it as like this privilege that we have we think of it as ours and so if someone comes and wants to have a piece of it it feels really really difficult and I get that because it's human you know and it's something that I'm seeing actually develop in my little girl like there are things that she see, thinks are inherently hers, you know, and those things are hers because we've given them to her, you know, but she doesn't think about them. They're just part of her life. Um, I'm, I'm not saying that, like, we should now try to, like, strive for a world in which we, like, take everyone's things and divide them equally among the, that's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is I think it takes a lot of emotional work to understand that we are born very, very lucky if we're born in the West. And if you're born in America with like an American passport, you are one of the luckiest people in the world, no matter what your economic situation. And um, you know, if you are, um, you know, if if you have, if you're part of a middle class here, even more so, you know. And so, um, yes, there are logistical problems, and there are a lot of things to be discussed when large groups of people come. Um, but I think the general attitude should not be that they have no right that we're doing them a favor that they you know are a, you know a plight um, that attitude requires a certain level of entitlement you know thinking that because you were born in this place of great privilege that you deserve it that you've somehow earned it i mean this is the same kind of thinking that makes you know president trump say that he made himself a billionaire no he didn't <laughs> um, but the point <laughs> The, 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 the point is that we all get so much help from the infrastructure and you know, the working together of our community. You know? And some people are born without a community or with their community destroyed. Um, so we need to start the thinking from a place of, OK, they, they, there's no other choice. You know? These are people with no other choice. So now let's forget all of the talk about whether or not we should 
and think about this as a logistical problem. How do we house this many people? How do we feed this many people? And those are real problems, which I don't have the answers for. <laughs> but I will think about them. Thank you. <laughs> that was very long-winded again. Yeah, that's OK. Maybe time for one more question, if we've got one more. Yeah. Hi, Dan. Thanks for being here. Thank you. <laughs> what artistic lineage do you perceive yourself to be a part of? Oh, wow. <laughs> um, well, I mean, there are so many threads, I guess, to that. I, I, I haven't really um, thought of myself as a part of one you know, artistic lineage. You know, I have you know, Iranian influences in me because growing up, I heard Iranian stories and I read you know, old Iranian poetry. And I am an American, so I have read lots of American literature. And, and I studied at the workshop, and I lived the life that I lived. So um, I, I don't know what artistic lineage. It's a mix. I'm a mix of things, you know? Outsiders, the lineage of, of outsiders <laughs> in all the different ways. Um, they tend to make good art, I think. All right. Well, before we let you go, we want to give you one more gift. What is that? Wherever you end up in the world, oh my goodness. you can represent Love your it. Iowa City-ness. So thank here you, you are. Thank you, thank Please you. Please help me congratulate Dina one last time. Thank you. Thank you. So we will have a reception at the back uh, where you came in. Uh, our friends with the Friends Foundation for the Coralville Public Library uh, will host us. And so we hope that you will stick around and have some refreshments. Our friends at Prairie Lights will be selling Dina's books, including the best American short stories of 2018 that you have a piece in. So congratulations Thank on you. that. We just it found was that edited out as by well. Roxane Gay. What's that? It was edited by another winner. Oh, of that's right. It was edited. The book was edited by Roxane Gay, who was our winner in 2016 of the prize. So we're keeping it in the family. <laughs> um, and so you can uh, get a book. And then Dina will be in the back uh, to sign books and to greet well-wishers as well. So thank you very much again for coming. And we hope to see you out at other book festival events. Thank you.